I'm delighted to share with you our progress on trying to develop brain-penetrant kinase inhibitors that target a novel, common neuroinflammatory cascade that affects ALS and Alzheimer's disease. It's been an exciting time for these two diseases with uh, accelerated approvals from the FDA, but these agents slow the decline of these progressive and devastating diseases. We are still looking for therapeutic strategies to prevent, stabilize, or improve the function of our patients. ALS, as you know, is an orphan disease which affords direct phase two clinical development pathway options. Alzheimer's disease, on the other hand, is not an orphan disease. 6.8 million patients with dementia, 12 million patients with MCI in the U.S., and countless of millions in the preclinical stages where these therapies may be, in fact, the most efficacious. These diseases have been difficult to crack in part because the relevant cells disappear. So the disease is the predator taking out weak members, weak cells, and so what we get to study under the microscope in autopsy brain samples are survivors, cells that have a mix of surviving mechanisms and pathogenic mechanisms. And deconvoluting those two different pathways has been challenging. For instance, amyloid, the amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles are not sufficient to cause dementia. This is work from my colleague, Teresa Gomez Isla at Mass General, where she's collected numerous cognitively normal individuals who have the same burden of plaques and tangles as those patients with um, cognitive symptoms. The difference, she, when she studied the brains in detail, the difference is neuronal loss and neuroinflammation. And, but the root causes of neuroinflammation have been elusive. Two years ago, we reported a root cause of inflammation accumulating within the cytoplasm of neurons in patients with ALS, and that is double-stranded RNA in the cytoplasm. This is associated with a pathogenic protein, TDP43, and TDP43 is also present in about 50% of patients with dementia, including Alzheimer's disease. So this double-stranded RNA, TDP43 combination is present in over 90% of patients with ALS, including um, all patients with sporadic ALS, and in about 50% of patients with Alzheimer's disease, all of them sporadic disease. This is an important finding because double-stranded RNA is a validated damage-associated molecular pattern. It engages with the innate immune system to activate antiviral type 1 interferon signaling. And shown here is our analysis of transcriptic profiles from vulnerable regions of Alzheimer's disease brains. Each bubble represents an interferon-stimulated gene, and it's increased in a genome-wide significance pattern in these different regions, suggesting that type 1 interferon is part of this disease. We have similar data in human brains from ALS, and especially from C9 ORF72, the most common genetic um, mutation associated with ALS, and also present mutations in C9 ORF72 are present in 10 to 12 percent of patients with sporadic ALS. And so the paradigm is that as one ages, one accumulates cytoplasmic double-stranded RNA within neurons. The source of it is likely the genome, and from multiple sources, genomic instability, reactivation of viruses such as herpes simplex virus, which is epidemiologically associated with Alzheimer's disease, as well as deep repression of transposable elements, which comprise about 50 percent of our genomes, and both tau and TDP43 dysfunction leads to their deep repression. When this double-stranded RNA reaches a, crosses a threshold, we, we trigger these neuroinflammatory pathways that lead to neuronal death, that activate astrocytes, and, and activate microglia, not necessarily in that order. They also can lead to hyperphosphorylated tau, and in animal models, double-stranded RNA is sufficient to induce amyloid plaques. Our therapeutic strategy based on this paradigm is not to target the double-stranded RNA. It's, that's too complicated at this stage, but rather to, to, to go after the neuroinflammation. And so our, this is the, the network where double-stranded RNA leads to interferon production. With, this is the canonical pathway. There's a second pathway involving double-stranded DNA, and that can activate C-gas sting and, act, and then activate TBK1, a common kinase, signaling kinase in this pathway. Recently, two months ago, Lee Gann from Cornell published that C-gas sting is activated in microglia, 
tau fibrils bind to my mitochondria that release the mitochondrial double stranded DNA into the, mitog into the microglia cytoplasm, and that activates this pathway. Our therapeutic approach then has been downstream. Both computational and laboratory studies have led to our identification of baricitinib, an FDA-approved JAK inhibitor made by Eli Lilly that's approved for rheumatoid arthritis, alopecia, and COVID. This blocks the inflammation and rescues neuronal death in our in vitro human cell-based assay. And so this convergence of data from human brains as well as uh, systems pharmacology has led us to launch the BASKET trial, um, Natal's BASKET trial. This is a concept we borrowed from cancer where one disease mechanism is present in two different diseases, and we recruit patients from both diseases. We treat them with the same agent. The outcomes in this trial are PK, does baricitinib penetrate the CSF sufficiently? Does it move the neuroinflammatory biomarkers in the therapeutic direction? Does it move the neurodegenerative biomarkers in the therapeutic direction? And importantly, there's a huge discovery effort on the end, can we identify plasma and CSF biomarkers that are more refined for this specific type of neuroinflammation. But we don't think that baricitinib is going to be the final answer here. Um, our systems pharmacology have identified that the mechanism of action of baricitinib in neurons is not necessarily canonical, and this is supported by our, our CRISPR-Cas9 screen of this human neural cell assay. We identified um, that TIC2 was a prominent hit in this assay. This is a Jack Kinase family member. It can phosphorylate STAT1. And three weeks ago, I was at a Keystone meeting, and TIC2 can phosphorylate tyrosine 29 on tau. This is work reported by Huda Zogby at Baylor. And that increases the TAF life of tau and exacerbates tau phenotypes in a mouse model. And so TIC2 inhibition may be um, important both for neuroinflammation as well as tau-based pathology. I don't have time to tell you about two other exciting hits, an orphan GPCR that's restricted to the brain that completely um, abrogates neuronal death, and an orphan chymase that phosphorylates both tau and TDP43. Both those hits are validated. Um, all three of those hits actually are validated in our cell-based model. In terms of genetic validation for TIC2, there are polymorphisms in, present in individuals that reduce the STAT1 phosphorylation uh, by TIC2 by 50 percent. These individuals have a reduced risk of rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and multiple sclerosis, and we are currently investigating their, their incidence of Alzheimer's disease and ALS. Importantly, these individuals do not have an increased risk of viral infections, fungal infections, or mycobacteria infections. These are all adverse effects of baricitinib and other JAK inhibitors. And in unpublished data in our, with our collaborators in, in Imperial College London, those individuals with this particular polymorphism in TIC2 have lower CXCL10 levels. This is a neuroinflammatory marker that we're studying intensively in the BASKET trial. For small bowel validation, I'm going to show you data on ducrovacitinib. This is a BMS very selective TIC2 inhibitor that was recently approved for psoriasis. It does not penetrate the brain, unfortunately. In our human neural cell-based assays, um, there is, we, if we treat them with cytoplasmic double-stranded RNA, we see this is the full proteomics. This is a, these are interferon stimulated gene products, and they're massively upregulated by double-stranded RNA. Treatment with this TIC2 inhibitor reverses this pattern. So we reverse the neuroinflammation, and then including CXCL10 in this human neural cell-based assay. In a, in addition to reducing inflammation, we also rescue neuronal death in a, in a um, dose-dependent manner. And so further studies have gone on to identify not only TIC2, but a second kinase target um, that augments the actions of baricitinib and ducrovacitinib at, at lower level, at low concentrations. Together with the Harvard Therapeutics Institute, we've collaborated and conducted a virtual screen we have molecules, two compounds, that are dual kinase inhibitors. They're nanomolar inhibitors of TIC2 in this second kinase target. From those hits, we've synthesized 31 different compounds for SAR um, analysis, and all these compounds have the potential of blood-brain barrier uh, crossing properties. These molecules then will 
be put into our proprietary pipeline with this human neural cell based assay, as well as double stranded RNA mediated mouse models that are in my lab at Mass General. We'll combine these with the biomarkers that are coming out of the, the basket trial. And together, we've established a small molecule discovery program with a high potential to achieve a developmental candidate against one or more targets. Our, we asked for $3 million for uh, continuing our SAR and blood bearing barrier optimization and in vivo proof of concept over the next year and a half or so. And then hopefully that leads to a bigger ask for lead optimization in IND enabling studies. Thank you for your attention and happy to answer any questions.